Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. Hey guys, what's up? It's Darren. Welcome to the Touch MBA podcast. In case this is your first time listening to the show, what we do is bring on admissions directors, students, alumni of top ranked MBA programs uh, to help give you an inside look into what makes each of these MBA programs different. And of course, how you can give yourself the best chance of getting into your target MBA programs. Um, I'm a former admissions director myself, and I just hope that we can give you an inside look into the entire process and into schools so you can make a, a better investment with your hard-earned money and time, right? So how many of you look at employment reports of your target schools? Well, I hope that's 100% of you out there in the audience, right? Employment reports are really important um, piece of, of of the puzzle in terms of figuring out how schools uh, stack up against each other. Maybe you have created your own Excel spreadsheet, you know, comparing important employment statistics that you've found. So I wanted to do an episode on how to parse an MBA employment report and MBA employment statistics. What should you look for? And not only, you know, how can you parse and read and, and pick, you know, the most important information from an MBA employment report, but also to know in what context are these employment reports produced? And then taking a step further back, you know, what is the role of MBA career management teams and MBA career management uh, directors? I just hope to give some more context surrounding this very important part um, of the application process. And, you know, I, I just think I had a fantastic conversation with Susan Bertulli who is the Director of MBA Career Management at Ivy Business School at Western University. This is based in Canada. It's one of Canada's top MBA programs, and they have a great track record when it comes to uh, recruiter satisfaction and student satisfaction. In fact, they've been ranked number one in Canada for five years running in these categories by Bloomberg Business Week. So I hope you get a lot of um, insight into employment reports and how they're produced in this episode. I certainly did. And remember that you can get free school selection help at touchmba.com. You can come to our site, tell us your target schools, tell us your goals, submit your profile, and we'd be happy to point you in the right direction there in terms of your competitiveness and which uh, MBA programs might fit you best. So go check that out at touchmba.com and let's get straight to my chat with Susan. Hope you enjoy it. I'm really excited uh, to do this next episode. It's something I've been wanting to do for, for quite a long time and we're finally lucky to get Susan Bertulli, who is the Director of MBA Career Management at Ivy Business School at Western University. And I'm so excited to have Susan on the show because I want to talk about how to parse an MBA employment report. I'm sure many of you, you know, are going, are looking at your target schools, looking at their employment reports, digging deep into them. And it's important. It's a very important piece of, of the puzzle when you're applying to business school. And I'm just really excited to have Susan on the show to talk about, you know, how these are produced, what's the context surrounding an MBA employment report, and of course, what you should look for in an MBA employment report when you're shortlisting top schools. So Susan, thank you so much for your time and, and jumping on the show. Thanks so much, Darren, for having me. And I'm very interested to talk about the employment report process. I think it's great for MBAs who are thinking about being a good buyer and trying to find the right fit for their particular school that will last a lifetime on their resume. So this is an important step in the process. Yeah. And before we jump into the weeds of the employment report, would you mind giving our audience a brief 
introduction of what you've been doing at Ivy Business School? Sure. So I'm coming up on 12 years with Ivy Business School, and I have been able to spend that time in the career management area. Uh, My first half of this career was on the corporate recruiting side, and that means in the financial services portfolio, which is my background in industry, I was able to work with corporate firms worldwide on branding, advising, and thinking about their recruiting footprint here at Ivy with both our undergrad and our MBA program. More recently, latter half of that 11, 12 years, I have been directly working with MBAs. That means coaching them directly for their careers that they want to get into after MBA. And over the last few years have stepped into the director position, which means budget design delivery of the curriculum that we deliver to MBA students to help them build lifelong skills, not just for the first job out of Ivy, but for their career so that they can continue to move along the career path and go where they want to go more long term. So that's really been in a nutshell what I've been doing during my time here at Ivy. Yes. And, you know, I know that for example, Ivy has been ranked number one in Canada for five years by Bloomberg Business Week for both student and recruiter satisfaction. And, you know, you guys get a really high response rate from your students, right? When you're, you're pulling them for, for their salaries and um, yes, have do. a very high placement rate as well, over 90% uh, for the past 10 years. So that's part of the reason why I wanted to talk to you because I think Ivy has such um, an outstanding track record um, in this space. But Perhaps we could start first with, you know, what you do, like the MBA Career Management Office, right? Yes. In your opinion, what is the role of a qualified career management team at a business school? We look at as we're part of an ecosystem. So we're not doing it all. We rely on our our faculty uh, to really help with the knowledge building that they're doing with our students. Uh, Our alumni network is very connected with us in career management, and our role is really to help facilitate and access, create access for students to our alumni so that they can really help them through processes and understand the industries and functional roles. And so we are definitely a bridge to that. And then us in career management is about making sure we're building strong relationships. We build trust. We're in the in the uh, business of trust and uh, becoming trusted advisors to our recruiting firms. Uh, so they understand our job is to help them understand the talent that we have in-house here, the students each and every year, so that they can really think about their talent needs and think about Ivy First when they're wanting to do recruiting. On the other side of that, we develop a lot of programming on the student side to help them grow and develop. Uh, Students are amazing. The resumes, the backgrounds of our student candidates that come in are very impressive. But they do need some guidance and they need to take themselves to that next level. And that's really what we do. We work as their business partner. That's something we say right to the students. You know, not at all times am I going to say yes and not at all times am I going to be your friend. Uh, We're going to be straight with you. We're going to be honest and transparent. And at times, we are going to push back. And that pushback is maybe asking you some of those difficult questions that are in your mind, but we bring them forward so that you can make good decisions through the entire program and get out the back end uh, what you put in throughout the program itself. And that's that career path that you're thinking about going to. We don't always speak in the first job. We talk about what career are you trying to develop. And that first role that you take out of Ivy is going to help you get there. Now that's Thank you for that background. And you know, Ivy is a one-year MBA program, which th- which means things are really accelerated. And I'm wondering if you could touch on the challenges of, you know, MBA career management in a one-year MBA program. Yeah, I, I always call them opportunities because I guess uh, I came in just as we finished our last two-year program at Ivy and made that conscious effort to switch over, not without a lot of deep research and information, but switch to the one-year program. So that's something that I've said I grow up with and I've always known, but uh, comparatively out there with other schools and two-year programs, we are different. Um, I always say to the students, don't get anxious There is plenty of runway in a year. It does feel fast. It is intense, 
But think about it in terms of we've kept the content, we've gotten rid of the space. And that's what we heard very clearly when we were switching to a one year is that we are clearing out all that extra space that you would normally have in breaks and days off and things like that. And what we've done is really created a one year program that is tight. It uh, moves quickly, but not too quick that you don't have time to make decisions and, and decisions about your career. So that first couple of months that you're in the program, we're working very closely with you as a group to sort of level set everyone and understand that you have a one year runway. Take that time. Put your head up look around, explore a little bit because you've probably been doing this career thing for uh, a few years yeah. now and you yeah. haven't had time to think, right? Yeah. So I think that's something to think about. You know, is that one year without so much space in the program something that's right for you? Because, you know, not everyone is right for a one-year program and that's okay. We're looking for those candidates who can make that commitment uh, will definitely motivate, stay challenged, work very closely with us, and uh, be able to get through uh, the programming that's going on. I think, you know, we also are different because of case. We're case-based 100%, and that's a facilitation contribution type of um, involvement that you have in the classrooms. It helps prepare the students to contribute and really work hard on their stories for interviewing, but it is very different from your basic programs that are out there that are lecture based. So I would say sometimes if you you know are a bit introverted and thinking, is this the right program for me? It can very much help you come out of your shell, but again, it's not for everyone. So I think the one year has been in career management very good for us because we have to be succinct. We have to think about our program. We think about everything as building blocks because each week we're building on something more for the students so that they can then put it to play when it's time to recruit. And that's important to us. Yeah. And before we dive into, you know, talking about employment statistics and employment reports, I'm curious to get your thoughts on what students or what applicants should look for when when they're looking at uh, the career management team of of their you know target schools. Sure, uh, we're all different sizes. We're all different diversity and backgrounds at all these different career centers. But I think you want to take a, a good look at do the career coaches in particular uh, come from an industry that they're working in. Uh, here at Ivy, we have coaches that, like myself, I cover the financial services portfolio. Because of my time here, I can cover other things. I've stretched, but I come in with that background. And I have connections and networks in that market that I keep very live so that I understand what's going on. And I have a counterpart on the corporate side who aligns with me for financial services to bring back market information to me so that I can be very very uh, succinct in what I'm, I'm talking to students about and know that I understand the market. So I think anywhere, you know, you go to a doctor with a specialization because they can help you with that specialization. And I think if you are looking at certain markets you want to get into, understand whether those career coaches have that information or have access to that information to really help you with questions that might be on your mind. The other piece to look at is the coaching perspective. How do they coach? And I always encourage, no matter what school you're thinking about, do a, do a school visit. Uh, walk through, the, you know, the career management. Ask to meet with one. We do regular meetings with prospects and candid candidates just to answer questions like this on how do we coach? You know, a little bit about our programming and what do we put in play? A lot of concerns sometimes about that one year. You know, can I make a decision? Uh, how do I make a decision? And so I think a lot of careers takes help you along your journey. And that way you can understand that you have a partner as you're doing this. Now, that is fantastic advice. So let's, yeah, let's move now to uh, those annual employment reports. I first like to talk about, you know, the context surrounding these reports, you know, why, why are they made? You know, who are like the key stakeholders surrounding the employment report? Yeah, I would say the school has, you know, invested interest in these reports because it is a report card on how we've done 
And I think that is, you know, both a marketing, a branding opportunity, obviously, to the market. I think it is a, um, a support document for, for future students that are thinking about coming in because they have something, a report card, to see how that school has done in that particular year. And, you know, digging kind of a little bit into the weeds when you're thinking about what's in that report, you do want to understand some of the geographies and the industries and the functional roles and just how and where people have gone and does it uh, line up to where some of the alumni are at because the alumni network definitely has an interest in these reports also knowing year over year there's quality, that there's commitment, there's success, and that they have uh, people coming up that uh, are in the same types of industries and functions that they went through. And it's it, it's a track record that you can re- uh, really demonstrate and show. So I think there's a lot of investment into these. We do have a governing body too. Our MBA CSEA has a standards that they've set out, particularly for MBA and, and now specialized master's programs and part-time programs, so that when we're pulling a report together, we're not just kind of willy-nilly and, and grabbing numbers. We do have certain standards, certain touch points we need to do, and certain things that we want to include in the report. And that way you can do some comparisons school to school to understand the report at at a better depth when you're looking at it. Does that help, Darren, understand why we do this? Yeah, absolutely. CSCA, is that a Canadian sort sort of governing body? Yes. So it's the MBA CSEA. Uh, CSEA. They have a website. Uh, Definitely go into that. And both it's international where we have schools, Canada, U.S. and beyond that we stay connected to. And it helps us ensure that we are producing these reports For example, the classes all close on a particular day, and then we have a couple of months to put the data together, but we have deadlines on when we can gather this and then put it forward. So it allows us to say that uh, we followed some standards, that we've reported on these standards, and at any time we can be, uh, any of the schools can have different audits that come through uh, just to ensure that the uh, numbers are what we say they are. No, oh, absolutely. Do these reports play a role in rankings? I believe, you know, the data from the reports do. So the rankings have their own criteria set out that they're collecting. Uh, but some of definitely the data that they require for the rankings is what we will we will put forward. And some of the data that's required does come from the reports and the crunches, data crunches we've done here in order to provide, say, Financial Times, Bloomberg Business Week, Economist. Uh, so any types of information and numbers they need, we do use those to send forward. And what is that like managing the process? Because, you know, many times you have to reach out to alumni, right, to get information, to get data. And I would imagine that for producing not only your report card, as you say, but, you know, data for all these different rankings, that can be very time consuming. I I think, you know, there's well-oiled processes within the organization. And so um, when it comes to ranking information and data that we're providing, uh, my marketing and communications department, really, they they spearhead that, they run with it, and I'm a part of that and making sure I get the information to them and helping them with auditing through, uh, you know, whether what alumni their list they need to list to go out to, uh, what particular student data they need. So it's a team effort that way. And I would say the same thing on my employment report. Uh, I got to do shout out to my operations team in uh, Ivy. Again, I, I don't do any of this alone. You know, I have a great operations team that helps me pull this data into play. Uh, we cross section it. I ask a lot of questions of them. And so I know uh, I'm back and forth a number of times. I often say the month of August when we're pulling this together, <laughs> I'm a little twitchy um, because I want to make sure, you know, are we going to get to our placement rates? And yep. How are the numbers looking and do you need me to reach out to a few more students to make sure, you know, that we're confirming what we're confirming? So there's a lot of work and interest that goes into this and and we're quite proud of what we produce each and every year. And and the statistics, at least at Ivy, have been, uh, we've been very proud of it. You know, high salary rates in MBA. We've held a high uh, placement rates. And even more importantly, we have high reporting rates. 
And the reporting rates is really, I would say, the secret sauce and magic. We have great relationships with our students when they're here and when they leave here. And so follow up and getting them to report is very important because if a student is reporting, this is their offer, this is their offer details, then we are very audit proof because they're giving us the solid information. But we have to get that. So we do a a lot of planning and, and programming and outreach to ensure that we're doing our job to gather as much as we can to get the numbers into the report. So, you know, the operations team does an awesome job, but so do the students. You know, they understand the importance of demonstrating how well and how successful their class has been and that it's a marker in the industry because they know next class, future class, past class, alumni, they're all interested to know how did they do. Yeah. And on that note, I think most applicants pull open an employment report or, you know, an MBA program website. And the first figure their eyes go to is average salary. Placement. Yeah. yeah. Placement and average salary. And salary. Like, yes. I'm going to get a job within three months and I'm going to be making <laughs> a six figures, say Canadian, right? Very um, much so. Yep. <laughs> so uh, I'm wondering kind of, you know, what you feel are, are the, the key metrics, you know, to really focus on in an employment report and, you know, whether, yeah, you have any, say, frustrations here or, or ideas here or encouragement for, for applicants, like what to look yeah, at. I, I would say jump in, rip it apart. <laughs> um, you know, I yeah. get the top line, you know, yeah. it, it's a matter of if I'm going to go to this school, can I get a job? And, and what are they going to pay me when I get that job? I totally get that. But reach beyond that. You know, really good buyers of an MBA will dig into the, the weeds, right? And really understand what is this report telling me? That's why there's 10 pages to the report or, you know, there's a few pages to every report. Uh, there are the top line headlines and, and start there. Understand that. But I think, you know, this is a a historical look at how the class did and went through the program. And so you want to be digging in a little further on, say, the diversity of industries. You know, put yourselves right in those shoes. You know, for us, a year from now, if I went to Ivy, could I be one of these statistics that I'm looking at? And can I get to the industry that I'm interested in? You know, can I get to the functional role that I'm looking for? Is it there? What are the firms? You know, usually most of us uh, across the schools will list and we do. We list the firms that we're engaging with. And it's good to see that there are some brand names there. You know, brand names show you that people out in the market, uh, strong companies are interested in the talent at that particular school and that they come and they look for talent. And so you want to be a part of that. Take a look and see, are those firms on that page, as well as other smaller niche firms in case you're more entrepreneur and you want to carve out something in the small to medium enterprise. So look for those names and and see what the access to that industry would be. The other thing I say is, you know, not all reports are equal. And so sometimes it's an apple to orange comparison and, and try to get it back to numbers that you can compare across schools. Placement, it's always big and large on the very top of a lot of the pages. Here's our placement, three months post-grad. Great. But dig in. You know, if 90%, I'll use our numbers as an example, 90% of the class has placed. That's with a 95% reporting rate. That means that 95% of those that were placed, 90% of the class, have told us that they got this job, what their salary was, was there any other additional bonuses or guaranteed compensation, they are reporting anonymously. And what we do is aggregate the data. And so it's important to understand that they have a job and what that job is. Uh, You can see other reports that may have an 80% or 75% placement rate, but only 50% of the students are telling you that this is what they got in details. So just understand the higher the numbers behind the placement rate, the more reliable, the more audit proof, the the more transparent that uh, we're being because the students are filling in the blanks for us. And that's important. Another one that I'm very pleased with is our salary rate. That means that of those 90% of students that received uh, placement, 
This year, we had uh, 86% salary rate, meaning they told us their salary. And industry standards is really probably around 75%. We try to report anything over 80%, but this 86% touts that we're not making up salaries here. This is what the students are receiving in salaries. And you'll look at our ranges in those salaries. And I think the 2018 report, I'm going from memory, uh, but we'll run from, you know, a 45, 48,000 on the mo- on the low side to sometimes right up to 150 to 250,000 on the high side. We put the full range in. We don't pull people out of that because we want to show you what those ranges are. And it also shows you that we are placing across a number of different industries. And that's important. So I think it's digging in, asking questions, and, you know, it's game on that if any of you are thinking about something doesn't make sense in this report to me, call, reach out to the school, ask the questions, right? Uh, You're the one who's going to be making a huge investment into a school. And so you want to understand these reports and make sure that all your questions are answered. This is awesome. Thank you so much for that. I I think uh, I have so many questions to follow up with what you just said, but let's start with the response rates that you mentioned, both in terms of, you know, number of alumni responding plus the number of alumni reporting on their salaries. Um, Mm -hmm. I think at least when I have been looking at different MBA uh, employment reports, I don't remember seeing that stat very often. I mean, maybe it's there, but I just don't remember seeing it. and. I'm wondering, you know, how can applicants best get in touch with career services? Like you guys make yourself very available, right? But I mean, coming at it from an applicant perspective, they may be a little bit intimidated because they're like, well, I haven't even applied to your program yet. And I'm already trying to get in touch with, uh, you know, your career management team (laughs) about placement statistics. And, you know, you guys are busy. You're doing, you're meeting with recruiters and students all the time. So I'm wondering if you have any advice there on how applicants can do it, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a tactically strong way where, yeah. yeah. You know, I think there's a couple of different opportunities. I see more and more schools are doing, um, uh, I'm going to call them open houses or, you know, we call them class visits. Uh, you don't have to be uh, applied to, do, to go to these. You just have to show interest. So take a look on the, com- on the um, I'm going to say company, let's say class, well, uh, schedules and, and the school schedules and websites to see are there visits, you know, class visits to the school, different tours, things like that. And uh, connect with admissions, you know, your front end contact generally, first contact at these schools is the recruiting admissions teams. And and they're fabulous. We work consistently with our recruiting admissions team. And, you know, it may start with, well, we'd love to do a resume assessment for you. Or if you have some questions, why don't you think about coming out for a day and, uh, you know, at least taking a tour and asking some questions within that. And then you can decide. So you don't necessarily have to be down the pipeline and applied to approach a school and start asking some questions. You know, if, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to assume for all of us, we want great people and we want great people in these programs. And so if anyone's reaching out and asking some questions, don't think of yourself as, as a bother to the school. It's an opportunity for the school to connect with someone who has an interest in an MBA, in particular, that's my case, MBA program. And we wanna hear from you and we wanna hear what you're thinking and what questions you have. And you know, sometimes it might be, I, I'm gonna postpone this for a couple of years and that's okay. I know our recruiting admissions team has worked with some folks with questions for two to three years before they actually put their application in and that's okay because you have life happening and you've got a lot of personal things going on financial things going on and you know what do your research do your research early ask questions and then when you're ready to pull the trigger you'll be able to do that and find a school that aligns and fits because you've taken this time to get out there and look around yeah no, that's fantastic. And the uh, the other question I had was when you mentioned a couple of things to look at outside of, you know, the average salary and placement rates, like uh, the diversity of industries and functions that graduates move into and, and brand name firms. I have two questions on this. The first is Ivy is relatively, relatively smaller, right? Uh, you guys have about, I think, 130 students each year. 
right? We went from about 140 to 150. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. 140 no, to no. 150. We are small. Uh, you know what? We take pride in that. It's a, it's in a, a, it's a good club to belong to. Yeah. So I would think that, for example, like what does it mean for an MBA class that has 150 students to have such a wide variety of employers or students moving into different industries and functions? Do you think it's like I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, do you think there's a function between the size of an MBA program and kind of diversity of those things that you mentioned or not necessarily? Not necessarily. I think, you know, we have a wide diversity and, and I should say too, take a look at the demographics. We put out our demographics. So, you know, our current class is sitting about 131. The class before that was about 165. We're, we're not about ticking the numbers. We're about getting the people. And so we look for diversity uh, of the classroom incoming because it makes a better conversation. And in our case at Ivy, we're case-based. And so we need contribution. And this thing works because of the combination of students, background, skills, experience, everything, cultures that we bring in uh, makes this thing happen. And so going out and through the process and reporting on the diversity, we do want, even in a small, small group. Now, I will go back to kind of data on the report cards or our employment reports. In some categories, if we only have two people that go to a specific functional role or industry, we will note that and we will not provide data there because part of our trust process is ensuring that we're aggregating data for these students and these classes. And so if it identifies, say, Susan going into this particular role, making this salary, um, the classes know each other and you can kind of identify who is that. So what we will do is say not enough data generated in a particular category because we don't want to identify. And that's how we uphold the privacy and report only in an aggregated uh, way. I see. Yep. So although we're small and we could be spread very thin, we will also take like-minded functions in that and sort of sometimes group them into other. And we always denote at the bottom who has been included into that group. So if I have one lawyer, one legal services, one uh, construction, one, we'll put those together, but we'll denote them at the bottom so that we can report out the range, but we can't necessarily get more detailed because we don't want to give our people away. Yes. Yes. That Does may that help? Absolutely. So smaller Absolutely. class size, I think we're very positive about it. And we get to know the students. And I think that also goes back to the challenges question you asked me. I think by knowing the students, we can pick up the phone or connect with them so that we can help them with the reporting process and get them to report. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll be sure to link to your webpage that has your career report on it that you can That's look at right. the PDF version of your career report. And so, yeah, please check the, the show notes, those of you listening, because the Ivory Report, for example, shows offers accepted by geography, compensation by industry. Um, and you can see where, for example, Susan wrote, like, not enough data, you know, under certain things, um, compensation by function. And yeah, it's really just thorough report. So yeah, please check that out. Yeah, my, my other question related to what you said in terms of brand name firms is do most schools, like, would you report on that every year? Because maybe sometimes a brand name firm recruits one year, but then they don't recruit the next year for whatever reason, right? So I'm just, you know, I want... Yeah, that's true. And, uh, and I would... Yeah. Sorry, you were breaking out there. Yeah, no, that's, I, I just wanted to, to know, you know, your, what advice you have for applicants there who, for example, might not see that one or two firms that they, they want to, to work for after their MBA on your employment report. 
Yeah, so I will say we've made, um, I say it, an upgrade there, a change there. Um, we're seeing that where some schools will just give a sampling of firms in certain industries to show that they have various industries. And it's really at our discretion on what we put out there. We believe in, in the transparency and trying to let you know who walked through the doors or in, and engaged with us. Uh, but yes, we do have some very specific firms who maybe every other year or every two years because of their cycle or what they're doing. So what we've done is take an approach across um, a trend more and done a three year. So what we've done now is instead of each employment report has only that year of firms, we have denoted it is three years and we do show the companies that have uh, engaged with Ivy across that three year period so that if someone's out one year, you at least would have a flavor that they have been here in that three year time frame. And then we do, we took it upon ourselves to denote with an asterisk those that have hired at least one Ivy grad in that past three years because we try and really demonstrate who our strong corporate partners are because the corporate partners who are aware of the reports are also looking at it and they take pride in in being our high performers where they've uh, brought in multiple people to their organization. And so we want to recognize that too, uh, who's been very regular with us and who absolutely year over year, as well as uh, in multiples have brought folks from our, our program into their institutions. Yeah. And on that note, kind of a question I had was, when you're building relationships, and I know you've done this over, you know, your, your decade plus at Ivy, building relationships with uh, corporate firms, right? To encourage them to look at, for example, Ivy MBA grads. Mm -hmm. Is it more difficult for you compared to bigger programs, you know, that might graduate, say, 500 people or 300 people a year? Just because of the, the sheer number, right, of candidates yeah. that a program might have. I know I, I like I, I've been in this program for a decade. So and the size has been the size. So like when I look at some of those those other schools having to, you know, three, four, five hundred or through the states, you know, thousand. Exactly. exactly. Um, yeah. Wow. You know what? Yeah. Wow. Uh, but I think what you're trying to do, um, you know, to build a relationship, just to give some insight to the audience on this, it isn't a matter of, you know, I call someone and say, hey, post with us. It takes work. It takes a lot of repeat. You're building a relationship. And I know in my early days here, when I was building, say, developing clients, I would say brand new to Ivy, it could take a couple of years, two, three years, depending on their recruiting, their cycles, understanding what their needs are. Uh, they may just touch on us and, and do a posting to start. But then, you know, once they seem to, once companies seem to get some talent from that school and they really like it, they may grow out what they do with you. And that may mean they may expand programs. They may decide to come on campus with sessions or participate in more different events. Uh, and sometimes that all is, it comes together with a tip from a faculty member, a tip from an alumni who's gone to a new company and there's no other Ivy there. So, you know, they're thinking Ivy first, they're paying it forward and they're getting back in touch with us to to say, hey, you know, there might be something at my company you want to dig in here and our corporate team uh, who are also portfolioed to professional portfolios will reach out and, and try to open the door and begin a relationship. And so it, it's not an easy process for anyone. And I think, um, you know, some companies will come and go depending on their needs or shift programs because of their needs shifting within the organization, we try to make sure that we are touch pointing. Uh, we have a, a great corporate team that we have times of the year where they're basically out on the road and they're going out and they are doing advisory. They have documents and competitive analysis and more of that fun data that we pull together and take it out to have conversations with firms to let them know what their competitive set is doing in the industry oh, and yeah. uh, how that's working. And and so it, it's a really value add to the market to let them know what we know and what the students have said from the student surveys that we've done. And it helps in their branding and their talent needs. So this is, you know, this is a two way relationship going back and forth that we spend a lot of time and energy on to build and retain. That's really interesting. I didn't know you guys did that or that schools do that. Uh, and yeah, because I saw in your, you know, your current employment report that 
215 companies posted jobs to Ivy, but nearly 80 companies, your students signed with nearly 80 companies. Yeah. So, so your partners are okay. I mean, because that's like what, a one, one to three ratio, right? Mm-hmm. But that, that's really amazing for the size of your program. I, I think, yeah, okay, let's, let's go back to the applicant side of things. But I love this sure. kind of inside look into how this all works. Uh, I think our listeners will find this extremely useful. What advice would you give to applicants, you know, who are using these employment reports to shortlist B schools and in their applications? I, I don't know if, do, do you guys play a role in the admissions process at Ivy? We do. And I then thanks so. for yeah. bringing that up. You yes. know what? I, I, it's one thing I always forget to talk to. <laughs> um, and it's important. Um, yeah. we do it every day and it's, it's part of what we, who we are in career management. Again, we have a very strong relationship with recruitment and admissions. And so if you have made the decision to apply to Ivy, the admissions team will begin that admissions process with you. Uh, they will heavily encourage you to come to the school for a visit or to attend one of our other city classes class visits or, or case simulations, just to understand case better. But once a candidate is ready for interview and they feel they need to be, they can be recommended to interview, uh, my team in career management does the interview. That is not uh, across all schools. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have worked very hard to uh, really combine our teams. And so myself, my team on the coaching side, as well as our corporate team, so six of us, take care of all the interviews that happen for Ivy applicants for MBA. So this year alone, we had uh, just over, I think it was 400, uh, four to 500 interviews that take place uh, through our rolling deadlines. Yes. And uh, our team take care of doing that interview. We make recommendations from that interview back to the admissions committee that's, that sits in re- uh, recruiting admissions. Uh, I myself as director also sit on the admissions committee. So the admissions committee is recruiting and admissions, MBA program services, financial aid, career management, and we have representation of about eight of us in the room in our admissions committee. And so decisions are being made on each individual candidate. I like to say to candidates who ask questions, so I'll I'll kind of throw it out here. It's not like America's Got Talent where we put all the faces (laughs) on the table and we take from there. This is an individual process. Every file is looked at, is discussed, is determined, and outcome is delivered back to that candidate. And so we are really searching to make sure we get the right kind of candidate for this. And and if you're not, and we don't feel you're the right candidate, we will give you that feedback too, that perhaps you might need a two-year program or another year of experience and then like to come back to us uh, because we want to make sure that it's the right time, the right candidate, that they can really flourish in this program and get where they want to go. Yeah. So maybe along those lines, I mean, could you give any tips to applicants who are preparing for their interviews? Be- yeah. And what you're looking for there, right? Because I'm sure you're looking for signs that they will do well, perform well in company interviews too. Correct. Uh, We like to say we think about you as a a good human in the program, you know, that you are going to get along with others, that you're going to contribute in the classroom, that you're going to be successful in the type of program we offer, which again, the case has a factor in that. And we want to look at you that you will do well in front of the market, that, you know, the goals and and things that we were talking about in the interview, uh, you can tell your story, that you can really develop yourself to the point that you can interview and be successful coming out of the program in industry. And then we look at you down the road. Are you going to be a great alumni for this program? Paying it forward, giving back. And and so all of those things are considered when we're asking some of the questions that we're asking in the interview. It's very clear. Very clear. And do you guys do like behavioral no, interviews? Or? But we, pardon me? Uh, do you guys do behavioral interviews? Yes, we do. Yep. Yeah, we do behavioral interviews, but we will tell you because we're all coaching. Uh, sometimes we take an aside and we do a bit of coaching in that interview, mm-hmm. too. Yeah, because it's part of what we do as a process and being able to give them feedback in the moment as they're thinking about coming into a program is this is important. So the other thing we talk a lot about is your business acumen. 
you know, read the paper, get in front of Globe and Mail every day, understand what the trends are, be able to talk to that. That's part of MBA being ready because you really need to be able to have an opinion. As an MBA, there's expectations in the market. You need to have an opinion. You need to be well read. Uh, the cases de definitely will help you with that because you do a, close to 300 cases while you're here for the year. But just understanding general market out there and being able to have a conversation is important. That's great advice. So let's zoom out a little bit now to kind of wrap up the show. I'd like to hear about your experience working with so many MBA students over the years, about their expectations with career services versus, you know, the reality of what you guys do. Because let's face it, I think probably, I mean, maybe not at Ivy because it sounds like you guys have this incredible relationship with your students, but I think that most students, no matter whether they're going to, you know, the best name MBA programs in the world always seem to be upset with their career services. <laughs> they're not doing enough. I mean, I, I hear it, right? And I hear it. Um, yeah. It's so, okay. so it's okay. I, yeah. I mean, it's, we wear Teflon, so we feel very good going in. Uh, yeah. No, you know what? This is, this is a big investment. This is an emotional time. Uh, you're learning and we get that. And so working in career management, we understand that there's ebbs and flows with students. And we also understand not everybody's going to like us or like what we hear, what we have to say. We often joke and say, uh, I think they tr a student truly appreciates career management three months after they're out or six months after they're out. There's that aha moment or something triggers or, or during interviews, even maybe before they get out, that something triggers and they go, wow, I've heard that from career management. And, you know, it, it reads true because the industry has told me so. So I would say, you know, the one thing we try, we use is we're not customer service. We're career management. We're helping you manage your career and make decisions. And so uh, not everything's going to be a yes every time you come to the table to talk to a coach. And again, I go back to we use a lot right from the beginning uh, of Ivy as you start to in interact with us that we're your business partner. And as you think about maybe if you're an entrepreneur, your business partner and how you relate to that person, they're not a yes man. They're not always saying yes to you because how do you build a business if somebody's always just around surrounding you and saying yes? What we're trying to get you to do is think, be human, interact, and really put the energy and work into you while you're here so that you can during interviews come across as a fit for the organizations and just, you know, as a human being that you would be a great person to work with because you're smart, you're generous, you're authentic in what you say and do, you follow up anything you say you do, you do. So that's where, you know, it's really important as we work together to understand that concept so that you get the value out of what we do here in career management. And I think it creeps in, but the true appreciation comes a little bit later on when you're able to make that decision or you're able to make the next move in your career and use these skills that you've worked on with us to, you know, take that next position or, or a titled position and really realize that this was the building blocks that are helping get you there. No, absolutely. And Talking about those skills that your graduates can take with them, it's, you know, that ability to, to go out and network and find opportunities. And I know that, you know, about a quarter of the class of 2018, you know, found their jobs through networking, right, outside the school. Yes. I'm wondering what, you know, what qualities or behaviors you find in those those students that are, are doing a great job networking and, and just finding those opportunities, both as a student and, and as an alumni. And yeah, let's, let's start with that one first. Sure. <laughs> um, I, I like to say, you know, they're in the program. We all think, we, we think they're great. They're wonderful. They have, they have the, the key skills. They can face their skill gaps and they can really uh, work and motivate and, and change those skill gaps into strengths. And so the ones that go out and do that networking, and we do promote that, you know, you're not going to get 
not everyone's going to get their position through career management. And we, we in, encourage that. Get out there, network. If you want something different, let's talk about how you go after that. And so those students who are successful that way, I think, do coach with us. They do create a plan. They bounce ideas off of us. We, we're that partner in, if I said it this way or I go about it this way, what do you think is you know better? So they're strategizing on how they want to present themselves to the market. And I think the biggest thing is because they're thinking about it ahead of time, they do a better job of it when they get into it. And so we do a lot of simulation here. We always say we play safe first and you practice safe first and then we put you out to the market. So by the time you're going out to networking, you've already done a networking simulation in house. You've worked with us on how to outreach to get the best results. You've coached with us on how, you know, to pitch yourself, whether it's, you know, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, or you're sitting down and someone's saying, so tell me your background. So we're helping you get ready, but you have to decide when is that time that you're ready to do this and then strategize and have a plan to go out and do it. If you just kind of throw a ton of applications into the, I call the big black box, and you're not talking to anyone, you're not going to have the results you're looking for. Yeah. And kind of my, my last question to you, Susan, this has been amazing, is how have you seen, if at all, employer criteria change over the years in terms of what they're looking for from your MBAs? Like, I'm wondering, you know, I think our applicants would be really interested to know, you know, if that's changed at all and, and what they're looking for now, you know, I mean, generally, broadly speaking. Yeah, I think um, those that have dealt with Ivy look for a certain caliber and student. And I would say that across any of the schools they go to, they, they sort of uh, have an expectation of, of our students coming out. We are strong in leadership. Uh, we are strong in communications, and I think there's a certain expectation to that. Uh, we have a certain technical consistency that you know we're building in so that they can do the jobs. Over the years, I would say they're still looking for that well-rounded, depending, certain, certain positions are, are more technical and specific, but that well-rounded MBA that's coming out that isn't expecting to be the president tomorrow going to do put you know committed and focused to the goals and and working hard and we hear it a lot fit and and it's a question i've been asking for 10 years what is fit and everyone has a different definition on what that is and some of it is uh, criteria set out by the employers other times there's that plus a gut check we are seeing more and more video interviewing and and the likes of and talk of different ways of assessment uh, because to have objective assessment through uh, a process in recruitment is very uh, helpful to get at the candidate that you're looking for. So there's always the technical check. Can you do the job or can you do enough of the job? We'll teach you the rest. And then the fit component. And we always talk about the airplane test. Can I sit on an airplane next to you, Darren, out to Calgary and not want to like poke myself in the eye <laughs> or throw you off? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the end, we got to get along because we all know in our workplaces, we spend considerable time with our work families. And so this new person has to fit in. And so they're still doing those kinds of tests, you know, for fit to ensure that they're picking that that best person that they feel will will come into their organization. And at the MBA level, it's not just about can you do this job? Can you do this job, but can I see you promoting and moving up two to five years from now? Because the work and onboarding and training that goes into getting someone, you really need to know that this person has potential to be able to do subsequent and future roles. Yeah, no, that is that is such great, great insight. And I have to ask one more question. Uh, bonus sure. question is, yes. what is your number one recommended book? to students on career planning? Wow, that is hard because I have so many. Um, or you, you, can, you can say two if you want. <laughs> I'm, I'm like a chameleon, depending in front of me is the that I, I ram off at the time. So uh, I, I personally, it's a personal set with me. I love Susan Cain, her introverted, quiet. Because this is a different kind of program, it doesn't mean that if you're introverted, you can't do a case program. 
Uh, and that guy comes from a person who's an introvert that's up in front of you presenting all the time. And so I think that was a, a it's a good book to help those who are thinking, don't self-select yourself out of our MBA because we are set up the way we are. Explore it, read a book about this, see what you can bring to the table, because the diversity of introverts in the room makes for a great conversation. So I would say that to that part of the, uh, the the folks dialing into that. And I'm thinking I have a whole kinds of, kinds of books going through my head right now. I like the one, uh, uh, Good Enough. Yep. Uh, you, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have all your things in play coming into this program because there is time to build your skills. And so be good enough and we will work with the rest. Thank you so much, Susan. This has been a fantastic chat. Really appreciate your insights into employment reports and and career services in general. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Darren, for having me. And, And can I just say, everyone, ask questions and we're there to help you. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Don't be shy. We have a mailing list. Go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up and we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Touch MBA. See you soon.